benvenidos, or perhaps we should say qualcosa in italiano, benedire qualcosa in italiano. Better to say something in Italian this morning because we're talking about Cristoforo Colombo. He's not a Spaniard, he's not an Italian. I'm not going to say anything more in Italian because uh, La Professoressa is here, and I might get correct as we go further. So let's begin by talking about you, of course. Many are called. Few are chosen. You are the chosen uh, this morning. And we start with the ironic situation of beginning our first full day talking about the end, the end of the world. What a great way to start the whole conference. We heard last night, however, that St. Augustine is a city of endings, or better said, new beginnings. And that's part of my presentation this morning. My favorite German saying is, alles hat ein Ende, nur die Wurst hat zwei. Everything has an ending except sausage, which has two. There's going to be a number of different endings in the story of St. Augustine, and the idea of the end is a critical dimension of our understanding, I believe, of the Spanish <coughs> legacy. So we start out with Christopher Columbus. We're talking about the apocalypse. Here you have a representation from an Orthodox church. You can see different figures here for horsemen, all kinds of battles going on. A typical depiction from the book of Revelation. This is a picture that I took the other day on US-1. I could not resist this. I've been driving up US-1 back and forth, back and forth. This was around the time Good Friday, uh, Holy Saturday, Easter Sunday, and it was literally a roadmark to a bit of Americana. You cannot separate religion and culture in the United States. You cannot switch. I mean, look at this. You've got Mel Gibson's movie, That Night. If you're familiar with that, Jesus really does get ripped apart. But the next day, you go through to VeggieTales and end up with an Easter egg hunt. That's the dynamic. I bring this up because the study of Christopher Columbus, from my perspective, has so often focused on the political, but not the religious motivations of this man from the 15th and 16th century. That's what we're going to do. An introduction here. My claim is that we're talking about the Spanish legacy. We're talking about the Spanish legacy here in La Florida. It cannot be, I think, it cannot be separated from the religious beliefs of Christopher Columbus, who is Italian. And if you remember, his name means, first name means Christ bearer. And Colombo, of course, is dove. He is the Christ bearing dove. And we'll find time and time in literature of the day that that's how he's interpreted. And towards the end of his life, this is how he started to sign his name. A combination of Greek, Christo, and Latin, Ferens, the Christ bear. This is how he signs his name. These are texts that we have. Columbus is a problematic figure, to say the least. If we look at 1894, in that time of commemoration, there were some who literally wanted him canonized. In a quick hundred years, there is a whole group that want to demonize him. There's a tremendous shift in people's sort of perception of Christopher Columbus. And you just say the word Christopher Columbus, and what happens is a whole tidal wave of feelings and emotions, sentiments, perceptions engulf people, so much so that you really never see the historical figure in many, many cases. What I'm going to try to do just in this brief time that we have, get back to the historical figure and talk about the religious motivation that is part and parcel of the Spanish legacy in Florida. So if I say in class to students what happened in 1492, I will, of course, get sort of the litany response, Columbus sailed the ocean blue. Then it stops. <laughs> then it stops. OK, what happened? What, what goes on? What happened? Why did he do it? Be it a Marxist or a capitalist or anyone in between, it comes down to this. No one does something wild like that without wanting some money and without looking for power. So that's the interpretation so often. Why does he sail off? For power and money. The trouble is, and we heard a little bit about this from Michael Gannon last night, 
we have to put this person in their historical context, their Sitzenleben, so to speak, their situation in life, and understand that Christopher Columbus is a in a time not only that's rife with apocalyptic fever, in other words, the general populace really does believe that Jesus is coming back. In particular, there's a long, deeply held belief that Spain is integral to the final coming. When we say the word apocalyptic, today we often get this kind of reaction. Here is, of course, from the movie 2012, based on an obscure opportunistic reading of the Mayan calendar. And how many times is LA the target of the apocalypse? Time after time after time, when the end times come, it's always a bi-coastal event. It's either New York or Los Angeles. A lot of people are filming in Los Angeles, so the end happens in LA. And you can go through the catalog, all the ways we Americans think about the end. Ecological, biological, nuclear, a couple films out there about asteroids coming, that's gonna be the end. We have an ongoing fascination with the end of the world, and we can see it now even currently in what are called the series of the Hunger Games. If you have people who are reading the Hunger Games or go to see the movie, that's the end of the world scenario. And all that's left is a dystopic world. There is a paradise in the Hunger Games. There is a new Jerusalem, so to speak, but it's only for the rich and the powerful. It's crucial when we're talking about apocalypse and end time is to understand how different our idea is from ancient cultures. First of all, if you look at Mesopotamia and Egypt, they have a cyclical time frame. If you look at their religious myths, what are they about? They're about a conflict, an ongoing conflict. A crisis emerges, a hero fights perhaps a mythic beast, defeats the beast, chaos, is averted, but then it comes back again, and again, and again. Ancient cultures, for the most part, are cyclical in their understanding of time. Greece and Rome are a bit different. They look backward. It's as if Romans look at something that's old and then write history backwards. They're very concerned with where they came from. This is a prime concern, of course, for the Romans, who now are at, at the peak of their power, and they don't have a story that explains how their past glory was evident of their present success. So we have, of course, Virgil's Aeneid, based on filling in the backstory. Neither cultures look towards the future. Neither cultures look towards the future. The stories that we find from these different peoples are traditionally hierarchical, and that what they're saying to the people is, we have to protect the status quo. The stories that are told are not meant to raise people up to change things. They're meant to keep people in place so that they hold on to what they have. When we talk about the word apocalypse, of course, it's from the Greek. It means revelation or lifting of the veil. But remember, the word revelation is a revealing. Okay? It's not a complete, new, open, clear picture. When something is revealed, the veil is taken off, so we get a glimpse, and then a new veil is put on. This is very much the book of Revelation. Uh, no one knows really what it says. You talk to anybody, down through biblical history, through the history of the different communities. This book, by the way, the book of Revelation is so problematic, the Greek Orthodox don't even want it read in church. Why? Because what happens when you read Revelation? There's always a group of people who get up from their seats, go up to the hilltop, wait for the end, and then they have to come back again. It's too much of a problem. Luther, when he was studying the book of Revelation, said, my spirit can't pierce this book. So the only book in Luther's translations that has illustrations is the book of Revelation. He had to try to draw pictures of what that book meant. There are, in the three great traditions of Islam, Judaism, and Christianity, there's an apocalyptic dimension. But what I want to underscore right now as we move forward is Columbus is the heir of a tradition that goes much further back than Islam, Christianity, or Judaism. The first group, the first religious group that talks about the apocalypse are the ancient Zoroastrians. 
And before we sort of dismiss them, I'd like to remind people, Zoroastrianism is a living religion. There are any number of people still in Iraq, or Iran rather, that practice Zoroastrianism. There's a community here in Florida. This is a living, living religion. What we have here is a depiction of Zoroaster. This is found in uh, the Vatican, the Sistine Museum. If you walk into that wonderful uh, room of Raffaello, you have this incredible encounter. You have the Academy of the Philosophers on one side. You have the theologians on the other side. This here is Raphael's depiction of Zoroaster. So he comes, he lives between 1500, 1000 BCE. His story is like many of the stories that we hear. He was predicted. Prophets spoke of him. People tried to kill him when he was a child. Does that sound familiar? It should to anyone from a Judeo-Christian. It's the same story of Moses. It's the same story of Jesus. It's actually a very common story in antiquity that's given to people who are deemed to be important. He preached a monotheistic faith. He preached a monotheistic faith before the Jews, before the Christians, before the Muslims. He preached this before, and we can find elements of this in what's called the Avesta, which are the five holy books, the Gattas, which are poems, very early. This is one thing that has struck me. You and I probably, I don't want to impose my thoughts on you, but you and I probably think in terms of linear time. There's a beginning and there's an end. And things happen along that timeline. If you have an apocalyptic faith, you believe that the world was created, over time different elements took place, different incidents, events, and at the end, something will happen and time will be over. That idea of a chronological timeline is unique to the Zoroastrians. The Zoroastrians are the first ones that come up with this idea of time, linear time. And why is it? Because their god, the one transcendent god, is struggling with evil. Now, evil is not a god that's at the same power, but it's like demons. There are evil forces in the world. How is God going to defeat them? God creates time and place in Assyria of millennia, and in thousand year periods, thousand year periods, where have you heard that before? Book of Revelation, the thousand year Reich. Thousand year periods are very important in this chronological timeline. God creates that so that he can defeat evil. Look at this. How do I know if I'm Zoroastrian that the time has come? The end is coming. Families will be ripped apart. It will start raining. Crops will cease. Livestock will be diseased. People will be doing strange things. They'll be giving up the customs of their fathers, their great-grandfathers, their peoples, and taking on foreign customs. Where have you heard that before? I can turn on the radio and hear that today. Okay. This is not an ancient message. I can hear people saying that today. Everybody's going to be a liar. There's going to be deceit, falsehood. And believers will be abandoning religious practice. How often have we heard about the decline of religion and people complaining in the mosques, churches, and synagogues that people aren't carrying on their faith anymore? Look at this. This is Zoroastrian. The Zoroastrians claim that at the end, a savior is going to come. We might, Christians, call that Emmanuel. The Zoroastrians are talking about a savior coming before the Jews, before the Christians, before the Muslims. They claim that in time, a savior will come. And look at what will, will happen. Evil will be destroyed in an epic cosmic battle. Evil will be destroyed. The dead will rise and be judged. They'll be cleansed, and the world will be renewed. Anyone who comes from a background of Christianity knows that this is what Christianity talks about. Matter of fact, this is what Islam talks about as well. 